Marina and I negate results. On balance, the benefits of the Internet of Things outweigh the harms of decreased personal privacy. Contention one, not so smart cities. According to the McKinsey Global Institute in October of 2014, affordable housing is fundamental to both the health and well-being of people and economies. If current trends in urbanization and income growth persist by 2025, households that live in substandard housing would grow by 440 million and the global affordable housing gap would affect one in three individuals. A lack of affordable housing widens both the wealth and race gaps. According to the National Alliance to End Homelessness, strong economies aren't enough to reduce poverty as poor people experience far less benefits from economic growth than those of higher incomes. Most importantly, because any benefit the poor may experience is not adequate enough to meet the increasing cost of housing. In the racial sphere, Patrick Sharkey from New York University in 2009 highlights that neighborhood poverty alone accounts for a greater portion of the black-white downward mobility gap than the effects of parental education, occupation, labor force participation, and a range of other family characteristics combined. The United States Office of Policy Development and Research writes in 2013 that a recent Brookings Institution analysis concludes that concentrated poverty has five wide-ranging impacts. It limits educational opportunity for children, leads to increased crime rates and poor health outcomes, hinders wealth, hinders wealth building, reduces private sector investment, and increases prices for goods and services and raises costs for local governments. Additionally, IoT data gives governments and businesses unprecedented personal information. According to Ted Lucom in July of 2016, privacy is the major concern with smart city technologies because many capture personal information about citizens and create profiles of them in order to make decisions about these individuals. Smart cities use this data to exacerbate the harms of housing inequality in two key ways. First, by concentrating areas of poverty. Kelsey Finch writes in 2015 that smart city technologies thrive on constant omnipresent data and these devices pick up all sorts of behaviors which can now be cheaply aggregated, stored, and analyzed to draw personal conclusions about city dwellers. This ubiquitous surveillance destroys the sense of privacy and urban anonymity that has defined urban life over the past century. Rachel Keaton furthers that smart cities, like smart city technologies are built into the fabric of the community from the ground up and it's designed almost exclusively for the wealthy. These developments are initiated, planned, and built by the private sector, which means they're profit driven. Truly poor people can't even afford the personal gadgets smart cities take for granted, and this exclusionary city making exacerbates spatial segregation and leads to fragmented demographics, which in turn leads to higher crime rates and heightened societal tensions. Secondly, smart city developments exacerbate racial divides. Kelsey Finch writes in 2015 that in urban and non-urban settings, big data analysis exacerbates discrimination. Reports by the Federal Trade Commission indicate that data brokers regularly categorize consumers into age, ethnicity, and income-focused categories. Given the glut of increasingly personal information and predictive inferences available, decisions based on illegal discriminatory inferences are difficult to find in the big data haystack, and thus, smart city services result in discriminatory impacts inadvertently, even in the absence of malign intent. For example, because the poor are less likely to carry devices like smartphones, smartphone data-driven infrastructure often diverts city services into younger, wealthier neighborhoods. Unfortunately, smart cities are not only one of the largest product shares of IoT, but are also a growing worldwide phenomenon. According to Janina in September of 2016, smart cities are the second largest IoT market in the world, and even more importantly, Mike Smart on June 30th of 2016 writes that smart cities are also the fastest growing segment within the IoT market. Nelson Hall quantifies that the global market will grow by 75% over the next five years alone. The latest U.S. Census Bureau data contextualizes this in fact, as they found that all but one of the 20 largest cities in the United States experienced population growth last year, synonymous with global trends, and they conclude that as this migration continues, cities will need to become more efficient in order to keep up with surging populations, and thus, smart cities will start to become the norm in the major metropolitan areas of the world. Mike Gerstein summarizes, smart cities are ways of turning urban environments into gold mines for consultants and companies for the benefit of prosperous and well-serviced inhabitants, and in the meantime, transferring additional resources and benefits from the poor to the rich which then exacerbates the largest factor that contributes to the global income gap and, and race gap. For these reasons, we need Sam and I affirm in our first point of contention is creating uh, intelligent electricity. As the Electronic Privacy Information Center writes, one of the most prominent examples of the Internet of Things is the smart grid, which is used to better manage energy consumption by creating a line of communication between machines to increase efficiency. As the Department of Energy furthers, smart grids integrate a plethora of technology, including sensors and monitors, to ensure that everything from simple household items to large manufacturing plants are running as efficiently as possible. The usage of real-time data translates to better energy production. As Gail Reidenbach of the American Institute of Engineers writes that the General Electric Company has used the Internet of Things to increase electrical output by 20%. This has two impacts, and the first is charging up the developing world. While it's hard to imagine, the International Energy Agency writes that currently 17% of the global population lacks access to electricity, also known as energy poverty. 
According to Brian Walsh of Time, 95% of those lacking electricity are located in Sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia. He furthers, due to its lack of global attention and effect on an individual's health and wealth, energy poverty is the worst form of poverty. Luckily, the solution is near. As a 2014 article from The Atlantic explains, nations in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia have the ability to leapfrog outdated energy grids and start from scratch at the cutting edge as they enter their era of development. In his analysis for the Global Energy Institute, Peter Meissen found that increasing access to electricity had a strong positive relationship with life expectancy and GDP per capita, while significantly decreasing mortality rates. For this reason, the McKinsey Global Institute found that 40% of the IoT's value over the next decade lies in the developing world. Second is making energy clean. According to a report conducted by the ABB Group, smart grids have the capacity to not only make current energy more efficient, but also integrate low carbon energy sources into pre-existing power grids, such as solar or wind power. As Rishi Bhatt of SAP states, the Internet of Things is a vital mechanism for the advancement of green energy. This is why Oscar Alvarez of the KTH Institute found in his empirical analysis of the developed and the developing world that the implementation of smart grids has historically gone hand in hand with the increased usage of renewable energy sources. The impact comes from Ashoka Kella of the National Institute of Technology, who found in his analysis of a dozen energy sources that on net renewable energy had one tenth of the carbon dioxide emissions that fossil fuels had. Holistically, Masood Amin of the University of Minnesota furthers that the adoption of the smart grid would cause energy efficiency to increase and emissions to decrease by 18%, which is why he finds that there is a 6 to 1 ratio of benefits to costs when it comes to adopting the smart grid. Overall, the implementation of smart grids can be seen throughout the world, not just in the United States. For instance, CNN reports that India plans to upgrade 100 cities with smart grids in the coming decade, and the China Britain Council reports that China has already implemented almost 300 smart grids throughout various cities. Our second point of contention is creating intelligent agriculture. A Beecham research report finds that precision agriculture makes use of a range of technologies that include GPS services, sensors, and big data to optimize crop yields. Support systems backed up by real-time data can provide information concerning all aspects of farming at a level of precision not previously possible. This enables better decisions to be made, resulting in less waste and maximum efficiency in operations. Jeff Pond of RCR Wireless News finds that estimates show that farmers using agricultural IoT systems can see yields increase by up to 15%, which translates to $5 to $100 more per acre. The impact comes from the World Bank, who finds that a 1% increase in crop yields creates a 0.6% reduction in the number of people living in poverty. Therese Correa of Beecham Research warns that if the farming industry does not embrace the use of precision agriculture and harness the emerging Internet of Things, it will be literally impossible to feed the world's population by 2050. Feed the world and affirm. Uh, well, no, not necessarily. So specifically in sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, in places where they're not grids, we can just already go to efficient grids instead of wasting our time wait, with like wait. conventional inefficient wait, grids. Wait, wait, wait. But what, why does that stop all of the other political and economic factors about, as to why those regions can't afford to have electricity to begin with? The main reason why they can't afford to have electricity to begin with is mainly because of the economy, like they're not rich enough to. But what happens is the reason why they get these grids is through foreign direct investment. That's especially how China and India got their grids. But I have a question about your first contention. Okay. Okay. So on the idea of smart cities, like uh, you give me this piece of evidence that like corporations are going to sell info to cities. Like no. what? <laughs> corporations okay. use the info to build cities. Corporations use the info to build cities. It's private. So what's revenues. the guarantee that there's going to be some sort of abuse with this information? All right. Pretty easily. There's like yeah. a couple of assurances. So like first, it just happened empirically, and Marina's going to get to that in a little. But also, Kelsey Finch tells you that the dis discrimination doesn't even have to be intentional. It happens inadvertently. Can you give me an example? Yeah, so like, let's look to how like like infrastructure is being used in like Western European countries that have that have like smart cities. So they normally use like apps and stuff to track like where there are like speed bumps in the roads, so we can look like ways and things like that. But the problem is because only wealthy individuals typically have those smartphone apps, that that means that only like potholes in like wealthy areas get fixed, okay. or in that those resources. So I would say this is an incredibly Eurocentric argument. You're ignoring the fact that other areas of the world with poor people in them who literally don't even have the access to speed bumps in the road because they don't have roads yeah. in the first so place. That would be that's the a greater form of poverty. That's a greater 
form yeah. of discrimination. So that would be the second one I was getting to, which would be the Keaton evidence, which also tells you that these, when they are when they are initially built, they exclude impoverished areas because they go into impoverished areas like we were talking about and build million dollar luxury lofts that no one can access and push out the impoverished. Wait, why are they building million dollar luxury lofts? Because they profit more that way. Mm -hmm. if they Is can, that if they example can, of a smart, like, city, I guess? No, 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 like they use that data to decide where they're going to build those lofts and like where the space is available. Okay, alluding to something you said earlier, I would contend that the societal forces behind discrimination are going to be more of a factor in the like uh, <laughs> discrimination that smart cities face. Right. Well, For instance, they, just because we have the technology of smart cities does not mean there won't be regulation in the future preventing yeah. so, discrimination yeah, from occurring. Yeah, but again, the the most important thing here is that the private sector is doing it, so government regulations don't factor in because yes, the government- Wait, the government no, no, no. does not regulate on, the private sector? No, 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 Like all of the evidence you're going to talk about how the government is trying to be transparent and doesn't what? apply to the private sector, but secondly, okay. Kelsey Finch tells you that it happens inadvertently. There's no way to regulate something when you can't prove that there's malign intent. Okay. But now can I Wait. ask you one more question sure. real quick? So is Sam gonna stand up in his rebuttal and read that weird like IoT implies internet being developed overview? I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I don't think it's weird. <laughs> 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 we'll figure it out. So. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is anybody not ready? Cool, cool. I'm going to start with a clarification about whether or not smart cities exist, which is kind of broad and crossfire overview, and then down your case. So there are 2,500 smart cities that exist currently in the world. To name a few, like Seoul, North, Korea, like Seoul, South Korea, um, like 100 in India. Actually, they cite that evidence and say it's smart grids. Smart grids are a component of smart cities. So literally, any evidence that they bring up about like smart grids existing is evidence that smart cities do exist. So now onto the overview. Generational poverty is the single largest reason people cannot afford emerging technology. And Sharkey tells you that concentrations of poverty inhibit any kind of upward mobility. And the National Alliance and Homelessness furthers that an increase in the cost of housing always outpaces benefits to any other sector. That's furthered by the Office of Policy Development and Research Institute in 2011 and 2013, respectively, who finds that neighborhoods of concentrated poverty isolate their residents from the resources and capital that they need, which leads to other community barriers, such as crime increasing and education problems that further restrict the opportunities of the impoverished. Thus, concentrated poverty, therefore, actually comparatively worsens educational opportunity, increases crime rates, increases poor health, and increases the price of goods. That becomes especially important when looking at the McKinsey Global Institute evidence in 2014 who writes that affordable housing is fundamental to people's well-being. And if current trends in the income gap and urbanization continue, 440 million households are going to have to trade up the cost of their rising rents with other benefits. Think about it logically. If I can't afford my house, I certainly won't be investing in solar panels just because they are cheaper than they were two years ago. So with that being said, move on to their first contention on smart grids. Their first impact is energy poverty. One key issue. This is literally the overview I just read against their case. It doesn't matter if smart grids are comparatively cheaper than energy was before because the Office of Policy Development and the Brookings Institute from our case, both conclude that generational concentrated poverty isolates these people from accessing any of these benefits. That's really cool. When we look to the IoT analytics, who writes that again, smart cities are actually, of, like smart grids are actually component of smart cities. So when they read you statistics, again, remember that links directly into our case. They're still having to defend that our net, like that our net harms aren't happening in order to win this argument. So second on their impact on renewable energies, three responses. First, IoT technologies are actually comparatively less energy efficient than the alternative. According to Ed in 2016, the biggest barrier to energy efficiency is our increasingly networked world because devices are being designed so that they're always on even if there's no legitimate reason to have them connected and these devices use more power in standby mode than they do when they're active each day this not only means that they aren't energy efficient but also this could technically increase cost because these devices are literally never turned off secondly IoT technology usually uses an abundance of rare earth metals in its processing and the practice of move, removing these ores from the earth is incredibly disruptive to the ecosystems and releases things like rare earth elements and dust into the atmosphere which as wired rice is especially dangerous as they contain toxic synthetic chemicals that are much more dangerous in regards to air pollution because they are harder to recycle and usually just dumped into human water supply. Thirdly, a study from Princeton University in 2013 found that even if all carbon dioxide emissions in every single country across the globe were absolutely zero, the emissions already in the atmosphere would continue to accelerate global warming and climate change for the next 1,000 years. What this means is my opponents can win that 100% of the emissions in every single country are halted entirely, but they still can't access their impacts because climate change is going to happen anyway. Now to their second contention 
discount agriculture. Three responses. First, the Guardian in 2016 explains that industrializing countries rely on rural jobs because of a shortage in urban employment. But IoT technologies, according to the World Economic Forum in 2016, are going to lead to 5.1 million net loss of jobs, which undermines current efforts to reduce poverty. This becomes important because job security is a prerequisite to food security, as without jobs, food can never be secure for people at the bottom of the bracket. Second, IoT agriculture hasn't empirically done what my opponents say it has. According to the Wall Street Journal in 2015, IoT agriculture has experienced negative productivity growth over the last 10 years. And thirdly, Grotel from the University of Agriculture writes that IoT in less developed countries actually relies on cloud infrastructure, which limits the scope of their services. Linthicum from InfoWorld in 2014 explains that without cloud infrastructure, developing countries lack access to IoT and therefore lack access to any of my opponents of doing benefits. That's going to be really important because he's going to stand up and read this overview that like they can access like benefits to like general like internet, but that's not true because IoT is functioned off of cloud infrastructure, not just internet. The type of broadband that they're going to bring up is not related to what the IoT actually is used from for these reasons you're negating. So with the spread of the Internet of Things, there will also be the spread of Internet connection. Now she tries to tell you that these devices rely on cloud connection, but the problem is in order to access the cloud, you need broadband network access. We don't, we're not saying Internet is the end-all be-all in terms of the IoT's necessities, but rather you need the Internet to access the cloud. It's all connected. And at that point, look to the GSMA, who finds in 2014 that the IoT will help finance the deployment of mobile broadband networks around the world. They further quantify that by 2020, the number of Internet-connected devices in the world will almost triple to 25 billion. The spread of internet is important for three reasons. The first is that it improves democracy. According to Keegan Wade of Georgia Tech, allowing half of a population to connect to the internet causes political discussion, causing a shift to democratization, which translates to roughly a 15% increase in political liberties and civil rights. Second, it benefits the economy. As Sean Chu of Tuong Lang University finds, a 10 percentage point increase in internet penetration rates raises real GDP per capita by 0.6 percentage points. Third, and finally, it saves lives. According to Deloitte, providing broadband access to 75% of the population has the ability to increase health literacy and as a result, save nearly 2.5 million lives in developing countries. With that in mind, let's move on to their only contention, which is about how, not, how smart cities are not so smart. Recognize on face big overview here. All of their impacts are about keeping poor people poor. At, insofar as Jose Quest of the World Bank finds that 80% of poor in, in the world live in rural areas, they're actually not going to be touched by smart cities. Recognize that the only chance we have at pulling poor people out of poorness is to use the Internet of Things because the majority of them are subsistence farmers and the only way that they can actually benefit and get pulled out of poverty is by increasing their yields, which uniquely happens with agricultural IoT technology. At the point where the majority of the world's poor don't live in cities, so even if they are smart cities, they're not even impact. And with that in mind, they then give you two impacts at the top of their case, which is a little wacky. They talk about wealth gaps and racial gaps. Recognize first, this is inherently always going to be worse in an autocracy because there's less respect for individuals' rights and sentience. Instead, what we tell you is when you spread the internet of things, you spread the internet and translatively cause a shift to democracy, which increases overall respect, which inherently decreases inequality. So actually, if you value things like combating inequality and combating racism and classism, you're going to be affirming because the IoT does just that. Even more so recognize the scope of this argument. Every single piece of evidence they read you is about the United States specifically. They tell you there's 3,500 smart cities and they can only give you one example outside of the U.S. because the U.S. comprises the majority of, this, of, of, of the scope of this argument. Even more so, the really key piece of evidence they read you is the Newcomb analysis, which talks about how smart cities have the capability to be used for discriminatory purposes. Scroll down two paragraphs and the very next line says that it's incredibly easy to solve back for this with algorithms and practices and legislation that are already being put in place. At that point, there's a problem that exists in the immediate short term and not, is not a long-term harm. Even more so, they then give you two warrants. The first is the concentration of poverty. They read from Keaton that this product is designed by the wealthy so it will be driven by profit motives. Recognize that smart cities are public sector investments funded for by tax dollars. It's not private initiatives like foreign direct investment. At that point, since the public sector investing their own money, they will not do it for profit margins. Don't buy this warrant as to why they will discriminate. Second, she reads that there will be massive racial divides. Recognize this problem is being solved back below the status quo. The reasoning for this comes from Scott Pepper at the University of Colorado who finds that legal loop Polls that allow for discriminatory practices under the IoT are currently being closed. Even more so, turn this against them because Alison Bruzak of PBS finds that the Internet of Things actually increases efficiency, which decreases inequality for two reasons. The first, it reduces the cost of living, and the second, it allows people more time to find employment. Even more so, look at the time frame analysis because Brian Kruger of Rhode Island University finds that those who feel like they're being discriminated against by their government are exponentially more likely to go out and vote and challenge the very structures that are discriminating against them. So while it might be bad now, 
it gets solved back for in the short term. Then at the bottom of their case, they read you this census analysis, which says that growth is outpacing everyone else and we need to adopt smart cities. Recognize that growth, that statistic comes from the census. They then read an op-ed that they don't cite that suggests that smart cities are the solution to it. Don't let them corroborate all of this into just census bureau data. The US census never suggested this. They also give you no probability of mass implementation of smart cities. Thus, I urge you to affirm in today's round. Okay, so where has IoT agriculture been implemented? Uh, like Uganda, Uganda, Sudan, Iran, Sri Lanka, India. Okay, and China. has that combated poverty? Uh, I mean, it's increased yields, which translatively helps with poverty. Yeah. Wait, so like an increase in yields, like yeet, like has combated poverty, like empirically? <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about uh, this idea of uh, like profit margins, right? Mm -hmm. So. What incentive does public sector investments have for profit? Well, they don't have to have an incentive. Keaton tells you that the private sector is the one that's actually building the smart cities. That's inherently not true. What incentive does like Cisco have to make a smart city? Okay, look, like empirically, the 2,500 cities that were constructed were constructed, constructed by the private sector. And like the reason why they have it, like Who? obviously they like public, them. the private sector. Like I don't know like this, the nuances, like what Can companies you name me, like, any did company that. At all? Like, look, like Keaton, logically Keaton, to me, like the private sector doesn't build like subway systems, right? Like the private sector might physically- Public-private partnerships do exist. Though. I know, but- like, I mean, like we day, had like the public subsidies <laughs> like two years ago and like that was a huge argument on it. Like obviously like the private sector like has like something to do with like the development of like inner city neighborhoods, I, like, like I know, stuff like that. I know, but like your key and warrant that you give says that the private sector has profit incentives which drive this discrimination. So if it's a public-private partnership that like greatly diminishes your like link into concentration. Of well, like think about it like empirically in the past, right? Like obviously like the, the public sector has been responsible for like housing districts in like the seventies, right? And they still like redlined and stuff. Like obviously that incentive still exists yeah, because like governments say, want like, to, US government governments want to racist. benefit from like tax like, dollars and wealthy neighborhoods. So like that would be another government incentive if you're going to make the argument that governments are going to be the ones constructing these houses. But obviously we're going to get to that debate. Wait, we're building houses? Like constructing cities, which therefore like a component of that would be housing. I guess, I guess I'm then really confused on what exactly is a smart city? Because you tell us smart grids or smart cities. Yeah, it's like a component. Like IoT analytics says that like, like literally like city, like smart cities are like when like certain parts of the city like use IoT data like in order to like develop. So that could even be things like transit or like a street light essentially. But the issue with that is like data obtained from like the street light or the transit is used to like so, discriminate in terms like, of housing. I don't travel like a whole lot, but like from what I've seen, I don't really, I can't think of any US city that meets that criteria. Actually, New York City, there's a $40 million grant in Ohio because they won this smart city competition. Um, uh, Santa but, Cruz like, what in does California. That look like, right? like, I, Look, it's not like it's not like we build like mass. It's not like we build like massive skyscrapers that like are full of like cameras or whatever. That's, like a smart city yeah. is literally like when sensors are used in the city to determine like where urban planning is going to be. And a lot of cities have been using that, especially in the yeah. US. But like just to be clear, like smart grids are a component of smart cities. Yes, you can have a like it's squares and rectangles. Like you can have a smart grid without being a smart city, right? No. Well, IoT analytics says, the no, no, IoT analytics literally says that a smart grid is a component of a smart city. Like, yeah, they're component. not separate. So all smart cities have small grid, smart grids, no, but no, no, not no, every no, smart no, grid no, no. is a smart city. I, yeah, I, well, the other way around. The other way. Square yes. rectangle, the rectangle is my square. Yeah. Anyone in the audience? Overview doesn't apply to developing countries. This is when you're going to look to the Linthicombe evidence. We're going to read at the bottom of your speech. This is talking about how it's different infrastructure. Linthicombe actually goes on to give two reasons why this infrastructure would never develop in poor countries. Because first, the government wouldn't invest in it because it's too expensive in the first place. Again, if they couldn't invest in a smart grid to begin with, they're not going to be investing in new broadband cloud infrastructure technologies. But secondly, he also says the private sector isn't going to invest in it because it's not profitable for these corporations to have to like to like fund the development of the broadband and try to profit about like with it afterwards. Again, look to the author that actually looks at the comparison of developed versus developing countries. Their overview doesn't fall when they're looking to like their actual impacts. But now let's go on to like some general defense on the case. So first, she tells you that 80% of people live in rural areas. That's fine. We're going to be looking to the Finch evidence here, who tells you that it's not necessarily people living in the urban areas that's the problem. The problem is the diversion of resources that happens when we see that wealthy areas are driven by this data. But more importantly, he says that it's like always worse if like it's going to be like a democracy can solve. But again, keep in mind his overview doesn't link because of the lenticum analysis you're preferring this evidence. But then he tells you that our scope is limited to the United States. That's when you look to the Brookings Institute data which it empirically isn't but then he tells you 
we can solve that with better policies because of Newcomb. But Newcomb also concludes that if these policies don't get passed, it's not worth it. But the important thing to look at here is the Finch link, which tells you that because of discrimination is largely inadvertent, those policies can't possibly solve that for something when they can't prove malign intent. And more importantly, you're going, he says that, like these are public sector initiatives, but again, prefer the author that actually tells you what it is as opposed to his like bogus logic. But more importantly, he just tells you that legal loopholes are being closed, but they're empirically not. And lastly, you're gonna, he says that we like increase efficiency, but this is when Marina's overview becomes really, really important and you're gonna be studying the impacts of housing. Because what we see is when we see the diversion of resources is caused by the internet of things data, we see that it creates bubbles of urban poverty. And he, and like the last card she reads in her overview talks about how that isolates impoverished like individuals and they can't access the benefits of IoT because no one's building smart grids attached to like urban slums. But now go on to their case, there's a couple of terms that become really important again. You're going to be voting on an assurance of the entrenchment of cyclical poverty that affected generations over like a chance that we might mitigate it. But overall, we're going to be seeing that when agriculture is actually implemented, it decreased yields. Overall, we're seeing that we increase harms to the environment because of rare earth metals. And lastly, you're going to be seeing that at the end of the day, you're going to be preferring proof that we're like concentrating areas of poverty over like maybe we can solve because people's electricity is cheap. Okay. Uh, yeah, so can we see the card for the two reasons why my overview doesn't have to I'm going to be starting on her overview. Is everyone okay? Okay. Starting on her overview, she gives you two reasons why our effects won't happen. That ignores some two important things. First, on face, we call for their evidence, and it neither says neither of the warrants they give you. But secondly, and more importantly, we would contend that what this overview doesn't make sense in the practicality of the real world. It's basically saying that the internet is not expanding in developing countries because no one wants to invest in it. That's not true with the trend at large because it is expanding in developing countries, and the main driver of that we contend is the IoT. We give you a couple effects of that. First, there's a 15% increase in democracy that goes uncontested. Second, there's a 0.6% increase in per capita income. So if you want to talk about benefiting people's Lives, that's the cleanest place you can do it. People who literally don't have electricity in the first place now can have that electricity available so they can cook clean and stay warm at night. But let's talk more about this idea of not so smart cities. Realize first, Jose Cuesta tells you that 80% of these people live in rural areas. So that means that when we do implement these grids and things, it's not uh, it's not going to see the effects of the not so smart cities that they talk about. Now, moreover, their own link, their entire link card, Newcomb literally says in the next section that it's literally so easy to solve back with legislation to prevent discrimination. Let's take an example. Realize that computers in the 1700s weren't a common at all, so there's no legislation against them. But now that they're more common, obviously legislation has developed. It's the same case with the IoT, and that's what Pepe corroborates, and they don't respond to. Now back to our own case, we talk about the electrical grid. Realize first, we tell you it can be implemented in developing countries. Realize that right now, developing countries are just doing that. They're developing their electricity. At that point, what the Atlantic says is that places that don't have grids can uh, just skip unconventional, uh, conventional, inefficient grids and go to smart grids. Now the reason why that's beneficial. Amin tells you there's a uh, ratio of six to one benefits, two trillion to 300 billion. And more importantly is the idea of clean energy. Realize there's an 18% decrease in emissions. That's what Amin tells you. But then lastly on the idea of agriculture, she tells you jobs are going to be lost, but realize that uh, uh, the people who are working on farms aren't going to lose their jobs. There's a 15% increase in yield. But moreover, back to the quest analysis says 80% of people live in rural areas. The agriculture technology that we're talking about here that literally benefits those people in rural areas. Lastly, look to the World Bank. who wants a 0.6% decrease in poverty for each 1% increase in yield. Ready? How do you regulate something you can't prove is happening? Okay, that's the thing. That's why some regulations against the IoT don't exist now, but as the IoT continues to develop, there will be more regulations in the future. No, that's not my question. Okay. How do you regulate something when you can't prove that it happened? Um, like oh, you can't. Like you can't. Yeah, yeah. So, so, awesome. so that's what Finch does too. Wait, so if it we can't prove that this exists, how do we know that any of your case is real? No, you can't prove that the intents exist. So when they're trying to regulate it, they can what say, wait, wait, so wait, for example, like a legislator yeah, that's, that's kind so of the thing. Example, like if so like, y'all can prove that everything you're talking about is true, like I'm fairly certain someone in the federal government could do the same thing. Actually, no, they can't. Let's talk about it for a second. So the federal government says that it's illegal to say that African Americans can't live in this neighborhood. However, what is legal is they can say, like because of zoning laws, no one that makes two dimes under the median income can live here. Okay, okay. Is that, isn't that better than a world before all that regulation? 
Your argument is that there's simply not. Our argument is that I should know. So yeah, so I would argue in the United States that like this not world is regulation isn't a harm. It's just really create more regulation. No, 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 no. So that example wasn't that like the world now is somehow worse. My argument is that like well Finch's argument is that it, IoT ex, like makes the current like the status quo problems worse. So it makes the impact of people discriminating based on income worse. Because yeah, that's still legal but even in the United States. Here's the problem: is that like again that you just reference like laws and regulations regarding the United States. No, that, I use prefer, that as an example. Yeah. Finch okay. isn't talking about Regardless, the US. Regardless, we prefer the larger example of countries that have literally no regulations right now on discrimination because they're in autocracies and dictatorships. You transition them to democracies, and inherently, you will always be gaining on net more regulations yeah. and protections. Wait, like, but, you might but lose no. some in the United States, but, but, but you no. also gain exponentially more Wait, in yeah. the democracy. So there was still slavery in the United States when it was a democracy. Doesn't necessarily like like democracy doesn't equal equality. Okay, but that's a not a, a very strong like it would be important to note that Russia identifies as a rights. democracy too. Wait. So does Egypt. They identify as democracies, but probably have some of the okay, worst. You gave me literally violation. two examples. That doesn't indicate an entire trend. On the this whole, is also stuff I think that's it literally indicates just the trend that government doesn't fire. determine oppression. So what? Like, is America going to make a return to slavery? Like, is that the point you're making? No. The argument is that Finch says that it makes all of these problems worse because it's faster to discriminate, so it's cheaper to just discriminate, just on also it's harder base, to inherently, up. isn't a democracy preferable to an autocracy? Not necessarily. Oh my, okay. give me one reason why an autocracy is better for an individual. Okay, I'm specifically, okay. There's literally any reason why an autocracy is preferable to a democracy. No, but the impact we are talking about You're are talking the same about impacts. You just told me not necessarily in response to is a democracy better than an autocracy. Give well, me it depends a, what you're give me a Wait, your question is not is a democracy is better. Your question is like trying to get me to concede that no, like, I'm smart cities don't concede anything. I'm literally just impacts. asking you what's preferable, democracy or an autocracy? And you just told me essentially it's a toss up. So give me one reason well, yeah. why an autocracy is preferable. Like calling yourself a democracy doesn't mean that you have like actual democratic values. Like, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have like equality. Fifty-five left running out. <laughs> the first voter is going to be housing. There seems to be a lot of confusion about what this argument is and why we're winning it. They make the argument that we lose our link because of the new comb and die. Two reasons you're still preferring the app here or the net here. The first is going to be like literally just call for the new comb evidence. Like the last sentence of that card is that any potential benefits to cities are outweighed by their power imbalances. We see that in theory that happens. Like remember the examples we bring up in all of the crossfires and they keep trying to make the argument that cities don't exist. 2,500 of them do. In, in India, 100 cities were made. 1.2 million luxury loss were the result, not affordable housing. But then the second way you vote for us here is the, the Finch evidence that they really, really undercover in the round. They just try to like logic their way out of this, like with this whole like democracy argument. But remember, Finch literally tells you that inadvertent discrimination is made possible because of I it doesn't matter if these things are illegal because they're going to happen anyway. And it doesn't matter if we can have like better restrictions or whatnot because it, because apparently we see that discrimination is happening because of because of IoT services. And then remember, like they are sending through all of Miranda's responses in summary whenever they're responding to this argument. The Brookings Institution is going to be the clearest way that we win our impacts here because they tell you that generational poverty always outpaces any benefits to, to the poor or to anybody in general because of the diversion of resources from the poor to the wealthy. Additionally, the McKinsey Global Institute tells you that this affects one in three people across the across the globe, that's a really clear access to scope that we are granted. The second voter is going to be just like based off of the, the, the terms that they undercover uh, on their case. The first is going to be the rare earth metal terms that I read in rebuttal Miranda extends in summary. Remember, this is really, really bad in regards to air pollution because that means that like water supplies are contaminated, which is a clearer, like, a clearer link to lives lost in the round because if I'm drinking contaminated water, I'm probably going to die from disease. But secondly, they also concede that more energy is going to be used because of devices being in standby mode that actually increases energy poverty because remember, that's going to be increasing the cost of energy because they're going to be on permanently. And then thirdly, they just say that like, oh yeah, jobs aren't being lost, but empirically we show you 5.1 million jobs are going to be lost as a result of agricultural IoT technology, and that undermines all efforts to safeguard poverty, which means that they have no access to solving for the poor, solving for developing countries, or solving really anything in the round because we short circuit all of their offense. For these reasons, you're negating.
even know where you want to write it. It's just going to be like, I guess on our flow, just like one thing I want to clear up. Uh, and then it's like, but I'll sign first. So it's going to start on all three judges. Yeah. Sure. All right. So really quickly, she comes up here and tries to make a tower grab at a last ditch effort as like, vote for us off of our turns. Recognize that these turns aren't harms of decreased personal privacy, so they're not reasons to negate today's round. With that in mind, the reason you're gonna be affirming in today's round is because the Internet of Things makes the world a better place. Really quickly, recognize the quest analysis. I read you in my rebuttal that was cleanly extended in summary and uncontested by the negative, and this is why they lose the round on base, which says 80% of the world's poor live in rural areas, which means that when they talk about re-entrenching poverty and harming the poor and disproportionately impacting the poor they don't ever touch the poor with smart cities instead there's no harm there but there are benefits access like but through things like agricultural iot with that in mind let's move on to the first voter which is the internet of which is expanding the internet through the internet of things what we tell you is we will triple broadband access through the iot that goes uncontested they read you a faulty piece of evidence which conveniently goes dropped in final focus and response what wade tells you is that by spreading the internet you increase democracy by 15 percent the comparative analysis to do here is that while there might be discrimination with current regulation, there is exponentially more discrimination in countries where there are not legislation to protect that, such as autocracies. Inherently, making that shift to democratization increases equality. So if you value equality and equal access for all, you're going to be affirming in today's round because the internet does just that. The second way in which we make the world a better place is by making better energy. They make, they make the analysis that pollution increases because devices are always gone, always on, and there's all this rare earth metal. What Alvarez says, which goes uncontested, is when you have smart grids, there is always a shift to green energy. And what a mean finds is that holistically and empirically there is an 18% decrease in emission even taking into account their arguments. We need this shift before we cross the brink to where it's too late with global warming. Third, is food. What Han tells you, which they never can test on a link level, is that agricultural IoT has the ability to increase yields by 15%. What the World Bank finds is every 1% increase in yields decreases poverty by 0.6%. And what Corey finds is that agricultural IoT is the only shot we have in making enough food to feed the world. At the point where we are the team accessing the largest impact on both magnitude and scope, and they literally don't even have access to impacts regarding the poor insofar as the majority of them live in rural areas and not cities, which may or may not be smart. I urge you to affirm in today's round.